Hello, everybody. We're going to be starting in about a minute or two. Just want to give everybody a chance to join. So stand by, and we'll start in a moment. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cloudian and Axela AI webinar, uh, Speed, Scale, Smart, and Savings. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A box. We will answer those at the end of the webinar. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, David Phillips. He is the Principal Architect of m and &E Solutions at Cloudian. He will be followed by Sam Bogosh, who is the CEO of Axel AI. And after that, Patrice Gotebeck will be the product manager at Axel AI, will be giving us a demo. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to David. Welcome, David. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. So I just wanted to kick it off. We're presenting a um, integrated solution with Axel AI's, the MAM asset management platform and our cloudy and hyperstore object storage. Um, so I'm going to provide some context for cloudy and hyperstore and how it fits into a media asset or active archive and then um, hand it over to uh, Axel to talk about the MAM platform. So if you're not familiar with object storage as a technology, um, it's essentially the uh, here we go, sorry. So Clouding Hyperstore is an op on-premise object storage platform. Object storage, um, as you may know, is essentially what the web scale companies utilize for their generic general purpose storage platform You know, these days. So Facebook has trillions of objects of photos and videos um, all in all of the metadata around all of the users is stored in an object store. Um, you know, YouTube has billions of videos as objects in you know the in their object store. So it is this massive web scale uh, technology that can is essentially infinitely scalable. Hyperstore is Cloudian's object storage platform that is an on-prem provides that web scale technology on-premise, in your data center, on your network. Um, it, so it provides all of those data protection and data avail availability technologies um, for your own private assets. Uh, and like those systems, it's also easily and scalable and essentially infinitely scalable. So it, it's based on a distributed architecture, a cluster of nodes um, that all all just you know distributed and highly available um, so that when end users and services are requesting data um, if there's for some reason some component or service that's offline on one node uh, the service can then redirect to the next available location for the data uh, which is very important you know to pro in providing that high availability for your assets so it, gen it generally um, plays in a media asset framework um, in the same space as an LTO tape uh, collection or an LTO tape library, you know, sitting uh, in a data center. Um, LTO tape is a um, proven technology that's been around for decades, um, but it's starting to show its age and it does not have the uh, flexibility and um, accessibility that uh, an object storage technology like Hyperstore provides. Um, in addition, your tape sitting there on the shelf or at an off-site facility, um, if you don't access that tape for many years and then you get a request and you some you have to pull back that tape and, and restore it to your production storage, um, 
you may get a surprise that that tape that you thought was valid has had some mechanical failure or has some had some silent data corruption. Um, the advantage of a of clouding hyperstore is that in the background we are automatically going through and checking the validity of all the data um, as a background process. And if we there any data corruption is is found, then there's a self healing process that restores um, and creates a, a new valid uh, data set. So you get the peace of mind that if once I put my um, valuable assets in, in a hyperstore object storage, that it's the platform is going to take care of protecting my assets. So when you place an, uh, you know, the hyperstore cluster is essentially a unique domain URL, um, just like you would access a website, um, like, you know, google.com, you know, for your Google Drive. Um, Hyperstore uses, uh, you know, the same HTTP, you know, uh, URL address for addressing uh, buckets and assets. So you have a cluster of nodes, they're running this service, um, it's storing the data across the, all the disks and the nodes. Um, and then for every write that is uh, written to this cluster of nodes, so in this diagram here I have a, uh, a drawing of 12 nodes in a cluster, each server has two independent nodes in it. Um, if the service in the background um, takes that file, that media asset, and shards it across all of the nodes to distribute um, distribute in a you know distributed data protection scheme we call you know that technology is called erasure coding so in this scenario I have a, a nine plus three erasure coding scheme and it's a little bit like raid technology in that you are creating uh, parity uh, shards for a any particular object and those if the uh, source data shards for some reason are not available or become corrupted, the, uh, those shards can be reconstructed from the parity uh, shards. So it's a highly resilient, highly uh, available uh, data protection scheme. And in the background, it goes and it checks uh, the validity of all that data so that you can be assured that it's, it's protected. So let's look at a, in a, um, a use case, an example for a single data center. Um, so the World Cup, you know, just finished up this summer. So let's, you know, in the case of a business that had a, uh, a video asset of a World Cup match and they wanted to archive that into their object storage, they would write it down into their object store. And let's say this data center was in Los Angeles. It would distribute all of the shards of that uh, file across the nodes um, for protection and, re and resiliency. Now, the powerful thing becomes, uh, so that asset is protected in Los Angeles um, and is highly, you know, is available uh, on that network in, in Los Angeles. The power comes in that by policy, we can replicate that data to other clusters in other data centers in other cities. So if you have a network link from Los Angeles to Denver to New York, you can take that World Cup MXF asset and replicate it um, across all of the clusters that are on your network. Um, so if some, for some reason, um, Los Angeles, you know, data center goes offline, it's not available, users and services can grab that asset from Denver or New York, all from the same unique URL address that you see at the top there. Um, in a sim, in a you know similar way, if you have colleagues in New York that need to access a file that you have in Los Angeles, they access it from their local data center and they get the speed and performance of access it from their local network. This also extends to a hybrid cloud uh, scenario where I have one data center, I have one or two data centers, but I want to have a third copy of this asset either for data protection, disaster recovery, or for um, to, in order to utilize some of these services that um, are available in the public cloud services, um, things like machine learning and AI that uh, um, Axel will talk about later. 
um, or any kind of com compute transcode, things like that, that um, are scalable, elastically, you know, scalable in public cloud services, but yet I can use my local um, object store as a gateway to tier assets to the public cloud for all these different use cases that I'm talking about. Data disaster recovery um, or, you know, utilizing public cloud uh, asset services. That's how this comes into play as an integrated solution with Axel is that Axel sits uh, on your network and indexes your production storage scrapes all the metadata for these assets, creates thumbnails and proxies uh, in its database, uh, and then interacts with, uh, you know, the kind of industry standard video editing platforms, Adobe Premiere and Avid Media Composer. Um, so it understands these video assets, it understands how to talk to the um, video editing platforms, and then once your project is complete, um, and you want to clear off space from your production storage, Axel provides the functionality for archiving these assets to the clouding hyperstore for long-term retention or for creating this active archive where I have a small subset of files on my expensive high-performance production storage, but I can browse and search and easily restore um, all of my assets that I've ever created um, that are sitting an online in my active archive uh, you know, in sitting you know, on my cloud and hyperstore object storage platform. Um, so as I was, you know, describing, the Axel provide, extends the functionality of the cloud and hyperstore by adding a, a um, repository for all of the thumbnails, proxies, and metadata for all of the assets, be it whether they're online or whether they're um, in our in the object store. Um, they're always browsable and accessible and I can always look at the video proxies to see if that's the clip um, that I was looking for and if it is then I can um, issue a command to restore it to my production storage for further editing or distribution. So with that I will hand it over to, uh, to Axel to present uh, the Axel AI MAM platform. Great, thanks so much David. I appreciate the intro. And uh, I don't know, I feel like we barely have to say anything now. You've kind of explained the whole thing. It's great. Um, but I will give a little history on, on our company. And then uh, basically my, my uh, role in this is probably mostly to uh, transition over to Patrice, uh, my colleague who's going to be doing a demo of the, uh, of the software and be really walking through some of the advanced capabilities, like the ability to harness multiple uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning engines. So the, the founding concept of Axel is, is really summed up on this slide. Um, we, we see this all over the world. We have customers that have accumulated a large amount of video and are just struggling with where to store it and how to find it. Because even if you can store it in all one place, it's not at all clear that you can find anything after that. And uh, you know, luckily there are companies like Cloudian that handle the, the scalable storage requirements quite well. But the search aspect and the ability to, to create metadata and then search that metadata about the clips uh, is much, but it's kind of the next problem immediately after that, I would say. So this is another customer site, a big sports venue. Um, you know, you go to these places, they, they store their, uh, their video in duffel bags. Uh, we've just helped them transition to much more of a, of a manageable uh, workflow. But essentially, the cameras are just getting bigger and faster all the time. There are so many more of them. I think the high-end uh, video camera business is like a $10 billion business worldwide. So people buy all these high-end DSLRs and RED cameras and Sony FS7s, and then they just shoot all this material which accumulates. Uh, and, and those drives uh, typically get put on a shelf or maybe put on a network. Uh, but the, the estimate worldwide is that each year, about 200 exabytes, which is 1,000 petabytes, which in turn are 1,000 terabytes. So basically, 200 million terabytes per year are purchased uh, for, for managing video. So one of our best customers has been Bleacher Report, which is a division of Turner. And they've uh, used Axel to search very large amounts, in their case, close to a petabyte 
of sports video assets. Uh, sorry if there's a bit of background noise here. It should subside in a moment. Um, so th they've been using Axel to, to make their whole team more productive because until they had Axel, they, they just had shared storage with no real way to search for the content. And it's, it's a huge step forward when you can actually pull up a browser or pull up a panel in Premiere and just find the content that you're looking for uh, without having to essentially navigate around and, and figure out where things are uh, by opening clips and playing them. Uh, so we have uh, actually at this point uh, over 500 customers. The slide is slightly out of date, and it's it's a pretty amazing group of customers. When when we started Axel six years ago, we thought it was going to be for like wedding videographers and high school sports teams, and, and there's certainly been a few of those. But what we've also found is that there's a really pressing need in midsize and larger. Uh, media organizations. Uh, and traditional MAMs ha are very structured and require you to copy everything into kind of their, uh, their little cave of, of uh, storage. They, they don't let you work directly on that storage. You have to check things in and check things out. So the, the key thing with Axel is because we just work with the storage you have, and, and work particularly well with Cloudian, we can, we can really democratize this stuff so the teams don't need a lot of training, they don't need to rethink everything they do, and they can very quickly tag, search, and manage their material. So the, the concept behind Axel AI is that first of all, we use uh, state-of-the-art web technologies like Elasticsearch and Postgres, and then we add to that a variety of artificial intelligence engines. Uh, our initial support has been for Microsoft and Google. Uh, we're adding Amazon, and we're also adding additional engines that run on-premise so that you don't actually even have to send the proxies off to the cloud. And when I talk about proxies, one of the main functions that Patrice will be able to show you is that Axel essentially makes low-res versions of all of the material that it finds, whether it's video, audio, images, even PDFs. So those proxies can then be sent off for analysis very easily, much more easily than if you had uh, only the high res material. And then the metadata comes back from these cloud or on-premise services, describing things like speech to text, who was in a scene using facial recognition, what was in a scene using object recognition, uh, text recognition, and so forth. This is the user interface, which I will only touch on briefly because you're going to see it live in, in a matter of seconds, but it has a bunch of nice features. The main thing is we've striven to make it radically simple. So it, it really is designed to be at the same level as, you know, Google Docs or Dropbox interface. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. And unlike a traditional man, there's, there's no training required. There's no learning curve. You can basically put freelancers on this and they can figure out what to do almost immediately. So why now? This, why didn't this happen five years ago? Well, partly it's because cloud storage and on-premise storage have gotten a lot more affordable. It used to be only the province of very large media organizations like NBC 30 Rock or uh, the BBC. Now, essentially, any media team, including corporate media teams, sports venues, churches, they can all afford this stuff. Uh, the second is automation, the fact that these AI engines are available and they weren't available as recently as even a year ago. So this stuff is all happening very quickly and evolving very quickly. Even the engines that are out there are improving literally month by month. And then finally, the accessibility, the fact that with web apps, you can build an interface that's easy to understand and can be upgraded easily. In the old days, you would have to install like a Java client or a local client on every computer. And, and with tools like Axel, you just have a browser front end. You can access it from laptops, mobile devices, iPads, and essentially get a consistent view from, from all of those devices. That's, that's a big difference from these traditional systems, which were more like, uh, you think of in terms of enterprise software, is more like installing SAP or something like that. So this is our team. Uh, the management team is me, Patrice, and Katie. Uh, Patrice handles the product side. Katie handles the operations side, and we also have a very distinguished advisory board. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to hand that over to Patrice for, uh, for the demo, and I will be available for Q&A along with David and Patrice uh, at the end of the demo. Thank you, Sam. Patrice, I just hand you control. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you, Sam. 
So basically, we had had a good uh, overview of how Axel behave in the back end. So how will I access Axel? It would simply be from the web browser. So Axel is server that you install on site. You access the interface via the web browser for ease of use and access. As Sam mentioned, you can access it from your tablet, from your mobile device. Uh, it's also much easier to pop the browser open and type an address rather than going through each machine and install a client app. So once I access my Axel system, the first thing I will be shown will be the login page. And I am going to log in myself uh, as myself here. And once the login process is done, I will land directly to the different folders that I have in my production storage can be any storage and it, it, it is not necessarily uh, a, you know a local drive it can be also sun nas even the cloud and storage if you really wanted to have your production media and editing workflow happening on the cloud and storage so for ease of access here on my laptop i have uh, simply pointed to my local drive here, Axel AI, and you will see that the list of files and folders that I have on the in my catalog folder is shown also in Axel. So Axel is going to crawl through your folder structure, automatically pick up what is new, and once it finds the files, it will render a low res preview that you will be able to load. So quickly, on the left side here, I have the possibility to browse through the folders uh, very quickly and jump to the content of this folder. I have also access to bins, which will be kind of the project area, which will allow me to select in and out points of clips and pass them along to my NLE of choice. You will have also the smart filters, which is where you will find predefined search queries such as which file has been approved, which, find, which files have been added recently, or you saved searches. I have also the workflow, uh, the, I'm sorry, <laughs> also the, the archive happening here, where you will see that I have actually linked Axel to a Cloudian piece for the archive, where I will be easily able to push files to be archived. And with the replication to multiple data centers, uh, you will have basically access uh, from any location to these archive files. And lastly, if you were to have the uh, transcode module of Axel, you can recreate new media with different profiles based on what you need. So this is the left side, which is meant to truly just browse quickly to what I will need to see, whether it is the project, uh, uh, smart filters, or a folder. On top here, you have uh, the search. So Axel has integrated with Elasticsearch, which allows me to basically just quickly do a search. For example, if I was looking for bikes, I will start to find these clips that have been automatically tagged by Axel. You can uh, enter as many keywords as you want. So if I wanted to do, for example, Axel approved, I will have two keywords that are coming up and I can just continue to uh, drill down. So if I wanted to say, for example, Bill Gates, you will see that I suddenly find only one clip on this criteria. You can also build advanced search in Axel. So if I were to click on the little lens on the left side of my search engine, I will have a new pop-up window, which will allow me to not only pick different metadata fields, we also have uh, uh, we also have uh, auto suggestion based on what exists. But it does not show up here. Um, let's see if I were to take the keyword and I do cam or oh, car. So you will see that they have auto suggestion based on what they already exist in Axel. And once I perform the search, I will have all the information with car and location Boston, and I can basically save my search from there. So on this little icon here, which is the global actions, I can save my search and I would say car Boston, for example. And as you can see, I have now this search query saved. 
So each time I will have a new element within uh, that will uh, uh, be relevant to my search query, it will be added to my smart filter. So what will happen now if I were to browse on the file? So if I click on it, uh, in addition, I forgot to mention that we also render some sort of a scrubbing that will allow you to preview quickly the clip as I browse. So once I load the video, you will see that Axel will, rent, will show me the lowest proxy that we have created. I can play. So it's a little bit of a boring video, but I can play and I can, for example, mark in, mark out my video and post comments directly on the timeline. So I would say, for example, a church time lapse, for example. And here I have this marker associated underneath my video preview to the timeline of this video. On the right side of my video, you will see that I have uh, different information such as a frame rate, uh, uh, the, the last modification date, the file name, and I can also basically create my own set of metadata fields that I can feed. So now this is the old way of doing things. Uh, this is the cumbersome way where I will need to either select one or multiple files. So if I wanted to, for example, uh, change the date here, uh, enter keywords, so such as church, sky, choose a location. I can have also check boxes, multiple select buttons. And I will save this information, which is now associated to the clip and will be available in the search engine. So, but that will take actually some time and we wanted to actually streamline a little bit the process where uh, as a video editor or as a producer or someone uh, or an archivist, I should be able to find my videos quickly as soon as Axel pick them up. So now that I have done this, let me basically just go back to this folder and you will see that this one has no metadata and same with this file. So what I'm going to do is simply select this clip and I'm just going to analyze this video with AI. And that is something we can work with you in order to automate the process. Uh, so we have different engines that we have integrated with, such as Microsoft Video Indexer, Google Video Intelligence API, Speechmatic for speech to text. And let me just pick uh, the onboard engine that I have on my laptop so I do not have to upload uh, Lores proxies to the cloud. So I should have uh, results much faster. Now, this file has been added to the queue and we are processing AI. So, what will be the kind of information? I'll get back to these videos later, but what will be the kind of information I will get? For example, if I send to Microsoft here, yeah, you will see that I have some TED Talks where underneath my video preview, when I click on one, you will see that I have uh, some information already available, such as facial recognition. And you will see that I have already pre-tagged this person, so she is searchable. But let's say that I want to, uh, I want to teach the system who this person is, for example, you know, one of these persons. So I picked this one, I will just I'm going to call her Sarah, for example. I can teach a system who Sarah is. And as we tag Sarah more and more, just like you will have on your iPhone or Facebook, when you start to tag friends or tag uh, family members on the photos, it will get smarter and start to pick it up automatically and pre-populate this data for you. You will see that I have also some keywords showing up, such as animal here. You will see the little penguin straight into the video with the segment associated with uh, uh, and different keywords that have been applied. But the real star of the show really for Axel is the transcript. Now I have this TED talk and basically you will see that I have the transcript happening. Uh, on a quiet setting, such as uh, a keynote speech or interview, uh, you will have uh, very above 90% accuracy in the whole process. But of course, AI engine is not necessarily perfect. You will not have 100%. So I can just go in and start to edit my transcripts as I play the video 
I would be able to edit my transcript and save the information. And once I'm done with all this process, I can export an SR, an SR, a TXT file, which will be looking like an SRT file. And I can reuse all this data uh, whenever, whenever I see fit. So that will be the speech to text. And lastly, with Microsoft Video Indexer, I will have also OCR where it will pick the word that it sees in the video. So all of that has been pre-populated. I do not need to tag my videos anymore. If I were to search, for example, animal on the keyword animal, I will see different tags, including the video here that I have where it was not tagged. But I do know that it was the keyword for animals. And we have integrated with other AI engines, which provide different tools that may be better suited than the Microsoft tool. For example, Speechmatics is solely focused on speech to text. That means that their speech to text capabilities will be much better than what Microsoft do. However, that's the only thing you will get. But it's very useful if you have a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, uh, keynotes and events and everything else, that will be extremely useful as an information gathering without necessarily the, keynote, uh, the, the keywords or facial recognition. Uh, we also in integrated with Google, where they will have a, a very a very broad uh, keywording aspect. As you can see, I have a lot of things, sports car, stadium, uh, including uh, aerial photography. And you will see that it's from above. And if I jump to this next segment, it's again from above and same thing. So you have a very large uh, set of keywords, including Formula One car, uh, cheering. So when the crowd is cheering here, and so on. So a very large set of keywords. And lastly, the onboard engine that I have just started to process. So let's see where we are here. Let me take this clip. Uh, and it started to actually show me cloud, dawn, dusk, hill, mountain, sunset tower. And let me just refresh the browser here just to make sure that I get the information associated to the timeline now you will see that i have a new tag here object tag where i will have everything mountain range sunset tower and so on it is not moving a lot so you will have a lot of the same segments for the same keyword but if i wanted to take the clips before for example here you will see that i start to have much more keywords adventure uh, animal again bike branch cycle sport you know waterway and so on. That's actually looks like it's a mismatch, which still can happen. But all of that has been automatically tagged. What can I do now? So I will, I've taken a lot of time and I want to make sure that folks have enough time to pose questions. Uh, I'm going to quickly show you the integration with Premiere Pro and then the archiving to Cloudian, because after all, we are co hosting with Cloudian here. So, let me just uh, uh, open a new project on Premiere. So what we have done, first of all, even if you do not have the plugin, I can simply go to my bin, for example, right here, just create a Premiere XML. I will get this XML that I can import into Axel. And here I have, it's coming. And there I have my, my footage with the in and out point predefined. And if I were to have any kind of marker set in Axel, it will also bring them into Premiere. So I can start to edit with the in and out predefined already. So that would be importing the XML, which you can also do with Final Cut Pro 7 or 10, as well as Media Composer, if you were to uh, have uh, Avid, uh, Avid workflow, with Media Composer where you can generate an AAF file in Axel. Now let me just show you actually a cool new things from Axel, which will be the panel. It is available on the Adobe Exchange Cloud. So I'm just going to say I'm accessing my local machine. So again, any Premiere Pro station, you just tap the address of your Axel 
I'm going to log in as myself. And as you can see, I have exactly the same features such as even the same bins that I can import into Excel, or I can just browse very quickly and drag and drop the files to import within Excel. I can even select more, more files if I wanted to. And even better, I can bring a whole folder. As you can see, it is bringing the whole folder here. So very easy to quickly uh, grab the file. It looks like that's a clipboard file, so it is not working. That's normal. And here you will see that I have my folder with uh, all the files from Axon. So very easy to integrate with everything. But let me just go back and clear everything so we have a clean slate. So what does that mean? It means I can do the same search that I have done before. So if I were to do, for example, bike, I will have all the clips that I need and I can just bring all the files around into Premiere straight from my search result. I do not not even need to go in and create XML files anymore. And that is the integration of Axel with Premiere very limited we are looking to expand it but i can easily preview my clip as well as i play my clip that's the clip i want i click on import file come straight to to my project and whenever i'm done i can either close the window or log out or change the sorting by date so now i'm done i finished my project i'm ready to actually archive to claudia so I'm going to the onboard AI again. It has been pre-populated. I finished my editing. What I can do is simply say, okay, I take this folder and I bring it straight to my cloud and archive. And I'm pushing it. You have a little status in Axel here that will tell you what is happening. You will see that the archive is already done. I checked. And you will see that now I have a little triangle and it is available on my cloud and archive you will see that i have now these three files that are showing up in my cloud and archive which means that anytime i need i can go and retrieve these files and so let's say that now i'm going to simply get this file and delete the high res so Axel is going to keep track of this file still and the storage and I still can go in and change the metadata if I wanted to and from there once it is deleted now you will see that the triangle is full so that means that these files are archived but not online anymore if I were to need them I can restore them from my cloud and storage very quickly and these files are going to come back alive. And you will see within a minute that this triangle are going to change again. And you will see the restoring job happening. And here we go. Now these files are back online and I can go back to editing and uh, or transcoding these clips to a new format if I wanted to, for example. And with that, that was a very quick overview of the Axel interface. The administration is very straightforward in Axel. You can choose which folders the users have access to. You can also select different permissions level based on the folders. Uh, you can also sync to your Active Directory server if you were to have an unmanageable number of users in Axel on its own. If I were to go to the second page of my admin section, you will see the different archives, you will see the different catalogs and basically that's it you just tell axel where do i watch where do i save the proxies and that's the end of the story and that's the same workflow for creating a catalog i'm going to the data fields now i mean and you will see that i can create different type of metadata or even change them on a go if i or rename them you we also import exif iptc xmp and Adobe Dublin Core metadata if they were to exist on a file. And that's really the bulk of it. Uh, the appearance will let you change the title and the, the logos that you have. But we also have a dark theme because it can be very troubling for people to actually 
uh, stare at the, at the white screen. As you can see now, I have a darker scheme here in Axel. And with that, I'm just going to bypass the advanced search and all the boring bits of Axel. This is something I'd be happy to discuss with you if you were to want a trial. Just a last quick note is you can have the information of who did what in Axel. Uh, for example, if I want to see who edited, edited metadata, I have all this information available. And with that, I think I'm going to pause right now and uh, basically hand it over to Chris and David and probably start the Q&A session, unless there are anything that people would like to actually see again in Axel or go deeper. Great, thank you, Patrice. Um, we do have quite a few questions here. Um, a lot on, on, on licensing, so, um, and I'm not sure, so how many users per license, and how is AI process billed, per clip, per minute, other? So, the, the, the Axel system, it's really by a chunk of five users. We do have a two-user profile. One thing to know in Axel is uh, we are different than traditional MAMs where we do not restrict the number of concurrent users that you have, but really uh, we are talking about named user. So I can have, for example, a user group called marketing and you can have 10 people from marketing just logging in with the same username and password. Uh, you will not know who did what, but that is how Axel works right now. Uh, in terms of AI licensing, there is a subscription fee because AI is still new, so it is evolving rapidly. Just to give you an example, Microsoft changed last month from V1 to V2, and we have to port the API uh, toward V2. So we have to make changes in the code and also take into consideration migrating the data. So all of these extra supports, unfortunately, uh, have us basically charge a subscription fee uh, on top of what the AI engine will charge you. So Microsoft is, I believe, charging around four to five dollars currently in preview mode per minute. Uh, this is expected to go up if they were to go up because there is now a huge pressure in terms of uh, getting the cost down for AI analysis. So maybe Microsoft is never going to rise the price, but this is currently what I know. If you were to use any kind of on-prem engine with Axel, where there is no upload necessary and no per minute process, uh, that will be a $500 monthly fee. But you can basically throw as much as you want in terms of tagging. Thank you. Um, are persons recognized across clips? In other words, if we have thousands of clips with a particular person, can I name them in one clip and then that person will be findable in those other thousand clips. This is something that is coming actually there, uh, with one, at least one of our partner. With uh, Microsoft, no. Uh, if I were to use the facial recognition with Microsoft as it stands right now, it will not retroactively apply the name to the, to the people. So you will need to resubmit the video, which we think is uh, unfortunate and we hope that Microsoft is going to provide us with some sort of signature on the facial recognition so that we can retroactively apply the name based on the confidence level of the signature that you will have. Uh, the other engine that we use uh, for the onboard system uh, has search signature and that would allow us to potentially actually we are working on that to have what exactly has been asked. Basically, I'm tagging two, three people. The signature is pretty much set. Let's retroactively apply them so I do not have to constantly uh, rename the person. So this is one thing if you start, I would say use a couple of short clips with all the people that you really want to be tagged so that you can teach the system. And once the system is taught, it will find uh, these pe people in the subsequent clips. Thank you. Um, can you run a clip through multiple AIs without any information conflicts? Definitely. Everything is split in Axel. So if I were to go back, if you remember in my speech Maddox, uh, it may be a bit confusing, but I'd take this Justin Trudeau interview. 
I have run it through Microsoft. And I even asked Microsoft to translate it in French. So Microsoft does some translation. So if I were to analyze with Microsoft, I can choose, excuse me, I can choose what is the language of the video, but what the language I want to retrieve the data as. And so you will see that here, even though the, the video is in English, uh, it has translated for me in French. Uh, it has its limitation. You know, if you if you ever try to use Google Translate or Big Translate, you know what kind of limitation exists, but it's still better than nothing in my opinion. So you will see that I have all this information with Microsoft in addition to the uh, 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 Speechmatics transcript. And I can just go ahead and ask to analyze the video with the on-prem engine to tag object. I do not have the facial recognition on the on-prem engine, but uh, this is something I could have done as well. So everything is kept separate. Each engine has its own entries in our database. Uh, that way there is no conflict because we really want to be some sort of a Swiss army knife where there is not necessarily one agent fits all. Uh, but you can have a bunch of interviews that you send to Speechmatics while you can have uh, facial recognition run into uh, uh, another set of videos, even though the transcript may not be that perfect. Thank you. Um, what are the options for importing metadata in addition to the auto-tagged metadata? In other words, original camera master logs. Yes. So that's actually a very good question. We have two different workflows that can be applied within Axel. The first one would be probably the easiest one because cameras will typically have an XML file. So we do have an XML import workflow that will allow you to basically uh, grab uh, not only keywords or metadata, but uh, uh, approval or uh, uh, even if you do have a chance to have black markers, let's say you're using the markers with, uh, let, let's say you have an Atomos box where you have the ingest and you, and you set markers on your Atomos box, uh, all of that can be brought. Uh, what you will need is to translate this XML into an Axel format. But we, we have people that can help you with that. So that's one option. The other option will be to use our API. Everything that you are seeing in the Axel interface here is using the API. So everything you see that you have seen me doing can be done using the Axel API, including updating the metadata. So that is something that you will need to potentially find a way to pass the metadata from your camera and feed to the Axel API workflow. Awesome. Okay, I've got two here and I've got a couple here on Premiere. Um, mm -hmm. When you enter into Premiere, are you bringing in the proxies or the original 2K, 4K, 8K files? We, we bring in the original. So when I launch Premiere and I access Axel, what I will be playing in the panel of Axel, because it's basically kind of a little web browser, what I will be playing will be the lowest proxy. But whatever I import will be the high res media. We do have ideas in having the, the proxy and then relink them to the high res. Uh, we, we have discussed a little bit with Adobe as to how we can do that. Uh, so we have potentially a plan to have a workflow where we edit from the proxy, but the rendering is going to happen on the high res, but it is still not the case. Uh, as it is today, we are talking about bringing in high res from, from your production storage. Okay, one more, uh, two more on Premiere. When you mm -hmm. bring a file into Premiere uh, from Axel, where is the clip located physically, locally stored, or say Cloudian? So when I bring it to Premiere, it's wherever the high res resides. So if you were to, for example, have Axel index, uh, a mod point that you would have on Cloudian, like it, it will look like a NAS or something like that. Uh, it will be from there. If uh, you have any other sort of storage, it, uh, basically we import wherever the file resides, the high res. Unless you decide to recall from Cloudia and then there will be the recall process happening from Cloudia. 
Okay, and last question. Does Axel also reference Premiere projects or just footage? So right now we only reference Premiere project, uh, pro, uh, footage. So if I were to bring a Premiere, uh, a Premiere project into Axel, all you will see will be an icon, uh, uh, the Premiere, Premiere Pro icon. You will not have a preview, you will not see the sequence, so you will not have all this information. However, going from, if I were to find my Premiere project, let's say you tag it, the file, with Axel, with metadata, I should be able from the Premiere panel to import the project and it's going to ask me whether or not I want to import the whole sequence. But you will not have the nice, the nice, uh, uh, the nice uh, features such as previewing, auto-tagging, posting markers, and so on. You will simply have an icon in Axel. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that's, that looks like it's it for the questions. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Patrice, for the fantastic demo and answering all the questions. Um, does anybody else have anything else they want to add before we wrap up? All right. Well, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We are here to help. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, David. Thank you, Patrice. Have a wonderful rest of your day, all. Thank you Thanks, very everybody. much. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks.